Welcome to the Preprint to Publication webinar. My name is Martin Esterman, and I am Prelite's ambassador and organizer of this webinar series. If you haven't heard about us, uh, Prelite is a preprint highlight service supported by the company of biologists. Prelite aims to summarize preprints to promote quickly dissemination of scientific findings and encourage discussion within the research community before the formal peer review. So for our first webinar presentation, I have the pleasure to introduce today the Professor Roger Pocock from Monash University, Australia. His lab uses C. elegans worm model to elucidate mechanisms controlling brain development and function at a single neuron resolution. Today, he will talk about his publishing journey from the preprint available in BioArchive in July 2022 to the final publication in August 2023 in the journal Nature Cell Biology. Roger's preprint was highlighted in July 2022 and immediately after publication was post-lighted by the pre-lighter Ethan Yu, who is also joining me in this webinar. So with nothing else to add, I welcome Roger to take the stage and delight us with his presentation. Great, thank you very much. Martin, just get my screen sorted out. I, good. Okay, you can see the screen okay? Cool. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. I think this is a fantastic initiative. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you today about the paper that we published a few months ago, as Martin mentioned. Uh, my name's on here, but the main player um, in this story is a PhD student, uh, Wen Yurt Wang, uh, who's now a postdoc in the lab. And I think this is a really good story because she was actually a PhD student in another lab, um, but wasn't uh, it wasn't working out so much for her. So after a year, she transferred to my lab and um, worked out very well. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, this new mechanism we identified where a sphingolipid uh, promotes neuronal health across uh, generations. As this is a bit of a general audience, I wanted to give us a little introduction to the um, C. elegans model, um, just a few features that are relevant for uh, my talk. So C. elegans is an outstanding model of organisms to study mechanisms of relevance to biomedical research. Um, even though it's highly diverged uh, from humans, they have a similar number of genes as humans and mechanisms uh, of gene function are highly conserved. Um, there are many advantages um, uh, in the days of uh, reduced funding, etc. They're very um, rapid and e inexpensive to use and easy to manipulate. I would say that the depth of knowledge in C. elegans is um, unparalleled in any other model organism. Uh, the whole lineage of the um, division pattern of the worm has been mapped. And also it's the only organism for which the entire neuronal connectome has been mapped. And I'll show you what that looks like in, in a moment. Uh, in addition, we have um, fantastic um, old fashioned for genetics, but also more modern CRISPR tools um, to dissect gene function. Um, in addition, we have this amazing new tool where we can spatio-temporally uh, regulate protein uh, levels um, at will in single cells and at specific time points, which has really transformed the way we can analyze protein function. Um, and over the years, C. elegans has been a fantastic model to identify key uh, mechanisms, importance for biology uh, in general. Um, so I predominantly work on the nervous system, and this is um, an adult animal expressing green fluorescent protein in the entire nervous system. You'll see a um, massive collection of neurons in the head here, which is like an integration center, um, and then other neurons uh, in the head and tail for sensing the environment and uh, motor neurons, and you can obviously see the axons here throughout the animal. It's a small nervous system in, compared to humans, uh, but I feel it's got great advantages to really dissect the function um, of neurons at single cell and circuit level. Um, we have great tools to enable us to visualize neurons at um, single neuron resolution. For example, these PVQ neurons here, in the tail of the animal, we use these extensively to identify mechanisms controlling um, axon outgrowth um, and guidance of these of these neurons. Um, and the mechanisms we have identified um, also regulate the you know, spinal cord development in, in humans. Um, the C. elegans nervous system uses um, similar communication mechanisms um, as mammals. Uh, famous neurotransmitters you'll see here 
also many neuropeptides, most of which um, have no known function at present, and my lab is deeply involved in trying to identify functions for these neuropeptides at, at present also. Um, I mentioned the neuronal kenectome, crazy experiment, slices of the worm were taken, taken to the electron micros microscope and synaptic connections mapped single cell resolution. So each of these shapes is a neuron and each of these lines is a synaptic connection between these neurons. So this is a wealth of information if you're interested in understanding how um, specific neurons and circuits can control uh, behavior. So my lab at Monash um, is quite um, diverse, I should say. Um, we work on uh, various aspects of, of brain development and function, um, in addition to analyzing functions that control um, germ cell development uh, and health. But today I'm really just gonna be focusing on uh, this neuronal architecture and health aspect of um, the worm's nervous system today. So, our nervous system um, is impacted by a variety of different insults during life. Could be a physical insult, could be a dietary insult or various insults that we um, enjoy at times, uh, but also uh, various disease states that can um, impact um, the nervous system. Um, at the level of the single cell, uh, the axon is a, is a very sensitive part of the neuron, which is essential for uh, maintaining the health um, of an individual neuron and, and as such uh, the entire nervous system. Um, and the stability and health of axons uh, require um, these structures called microtubules uh, that provide structure to the axon but also enables communication along the axon. Um, and this is required obviously for efficient transport of various organelles and other and also macromolecules. Um, in addition, there are interactions with the environment that are important for maintaining the structure um, of the axon through the ECM and, and uh, various adhesion molecules. Um, so the start of this project was to try and um, ask whether we could identify any new regulators um, of axon integrity. Um, and we chose a specific um, neuron here. So I'm just going to talk about one neuron today, so it's very straightforward. And it's the PLM neuron that's located in the tail here. And you'll notice that it extends a short neurite to the posterior and a long axon that traverses three quarters of the length of, of the worm here. Um, this neuron is born during embryogenesis um, and it's been known for a while that maintenance of axon structure and function using microtubules is required for long range transport, as I mentioned, and for the health of this axon. If you put this in context, this is probably, you know, the length of our sciatic nerve from our hip to our foot in humans, so it's a long axon. So previous work from the Hilliard lab had identified a mutation uh, in this alpha tubulin acetyltransferase 1 uh, gene called MEX17 uh, that causes adult onset progressive axon degeneration. So this is an animal here uh, in which this axon has broken. They develop normally at the structural level. You can, you can visualize this, this normal axon uh, up to adulthood, but then as they um, become older, this axon breaks. And you can see an example in the, in the animal here. So we wanted to use this as a, a model to under, identify um, molecules that could potentially uh, modify this phenotype. Uh, the penetrance of this phenotype is around 50%. So we could potentially um, identify enhancers and suppressors of this phenotype quite easily. Um, and the student at the time, Wenyo, was really interested in, in um, asking whether molecules in plants that have been used for many years for Chinese, in Chinese medicine um, could potentially alter this phenotype. Um, so she performed a screen um, from a natural product library uh, she'd screened around 30 natural products, uh, and we had one significant hit, uh, and this is called eosolic acid, and it's found in apple peel and herbs, and this is a structure um, of eosolic acid here. So the setup of our experiment initially was to continually provide eosolic acid to the animal. So we 
placed animals on plates containing ozonic acid in the media uh, from this late larval stage and exposed throughout adulthood, embryogenesis, the four larval stages, and then scored the PLM axons in three-day-old adults. And we observed a significant decrease in the percentage of these breaks that we observe in the PLM axons. So that was great. We've um, identified a molecule that can suppress this phenotype. Um, we next wanted to ask when um, during development um, UA may be acting. So for this, we um, exposed uh, animals to UA either during oocyte development, during embryogenesis, or from larvae to adults, and then scored uh, three-day-old adults again. And we're really fascinated to find fascinated to find out that when we exposed UA ucyanic acid to oocytes, we could suppress the phenotype in A here. But when we uh, provided ucyanic acid later, we could not. Um, so that suggested that as we're feeding the mothers, that this neuroprotection is transferred from the mother to the oocyte in, in some way. Um, so then we thought, let's, let's try a crazy experiment. Didn't necessarily expect this one to work, but we wanted to, as, as there's a potential transfer of information between the mother and the, and the oocyte, we wanted to ask whether this could potentially be transferred across multiple generations. Um, so in this experiment, we provided either the vehicle or eosolic acid just for 16 hours to adult animals. And then we removed these animals from the eosolic acid and then scored PLM uh, axon breaks over multiple generations. Um, and as in the first experiment, we found that our F1 animals um, had a suppression of the phenotype, but we were really intrigued to find that the F2 animals also had suppression of the PLM axon breaks. However, uh, it didn't um, continue any further. So this tells us that UA in the grandmother uh, protects the grandchildren. Um, and this is a, a means of intergenerational inheritance. So next we wanted to obviously understand the mechanism underlying um, UA neuroprotection and, and how it's transmitted. Um, so previous work uh, from multiple labs has shown that um, there is a yolk complex that is transferred from a mother's intestinal cells to the oocyte. And this is a lipoprotein lipid complex and this nourishes the, the oocyte. And it's also previously been shown that on oocytes, there's a particular uh, endocytic yolk receptor that's expressed called RME2. And this is absolutely required for receipt of the yolk uh, on the oocyte. So we asked a very simple question whether RME2 uh, has an effect on UA uh, neuroprotection. Um, so we use an RNAi approach for this. This is our control. So orange is UA application. However, when we knock down RME2, we do not see this effect of UA. So that suggests that whatever UA is doing in the intestine requires transfer to the oocyte through the RME2 receptor. Um, and that potentially um, UA is affecting some yolk uh, lipoprotein or lipid uh, to engender this, this neuroprotection. Um, so I stalled quite a bit on this experiment. I didn't think this was going to show us anything, to be honest, uh, but was persuaded in the end to perform RNA sequencing. So we supplied um, UA for 12 hours to adults and then performed RNA sequencing. And to be honest, very few genes changed their expression at all. Some stress response genes did, um, but very few. But one that did um, stand out to us was a lipid gene. Um, and this is a gene called ASAH1. And we found that this gene is upregulated when you provide, provide your solic acid. So I'd never heard of um, ASAH1 before, but it encodes an acid ceramidase and it's a key enzyme in sphingolipid metabolism. And a few slides time, I'll talk a little bit about the pathway in which ASH1 is, is, is located in the sphingolipid pathway. Uh, but we, as we've showed that ASH1 is upregulated, when you provide ASH, um, won't provide you solic acid, sorry. Uh, we wanted to ask whether ASH1 expression is required for the neuroprotective effect. So again, we use an RNAi approach uh, where we knock down ASH1 um, and applied UA and UA was unable to protect 
uh, the PLM axons any longer when you knock down ASH1. So that suggests that ASH1 is indeed required for the protection provided by eosolic acid. So where is ASH1 expressed? Uh, we hypothesized it would be in the intestine because that seems to be where the transfer um, initiates um, to the oocyte. Um, so we generated um, a CRISPR-based um, reporter here. So here, here we have the ASH1 gene with the exons in black. Um, we used a ribosome skipping sequences F2A and then GFP and H2B such that the um, endogenous ASH1 protein will be generated and a separate GFP H2B protein generated so that we can visualize expression in the nucleus, in the nuclei. Um, and we saw quite an intriguing um, expression pattern. The only tissue we observed um, expression was in the intestine, but had a very unusual um, pattern here. So CLANs only has 20 intestinal cells, um, and, but we observed expression not in those first two, and then in a few here in the anterior to the mid body, but then no expression in the posterior. But it is indeed expressed in the intestine and we're investigating um, how uh, and why this specific expression pattern um, is, is, is regulated. I can talk about that later if you would, if you would like. Um, we use this reporter, so it's an endogenous CRISPR-based tool, to confirm uh, the induction of ASH1 by eosolic acid. So we measured the nuclear GFP fluorescence in these intestinal cells in control and eosolic acid. And indeed, again, we um, observed induction. Um, and this confirmed our RNA sequencing results, but also we performed qPCR to show that ASH1 is induced. So we've got three different methods to show that ASH1 is, is, is induced there. Um, so we only see expression in the intestine. So we wanted to ask whether ASH1 expression in the intestine is sufficient to protect the PLM uh, neurons. So for that, we use a transgenic approach. There's a known intestinal specific promoter called GUESS1 here. So we simply drove ASH1 cDNA under the GUESS1 promoter and asked whether it affected the PLMs. Uh, and indeed in two transgenic lines here, um, in blue, we can see that PLM axon breaks are reduced when we express ASH1 in the intestine. Um, so that tells us that um, intest increased intestinal ASH1 can be neuroprotective. Um, potentially through uh, transfer of a molecule to uh, oocytes. But the next um, part of this story was to try and understand how this happens. So the sphingolipid biosynthesis pathway is really bloody complicated. Um, I've got a very small aspect of it here because this is all we really need to be talking about. Uh, there's a salvage pathway here. ASH1 is an enzyme that converts ceramide to sphingosine. Downstream of sphingosine is, a, is a, uh, an enzyme here called SPHK1, which converts sphingosine to sphingosine 1-phosphate. I'm not going to talk about the um, molecules in gray here. They're not really needed for this, uh, this story. Um, but just so you know that the sphingolipid pathway um, is much more complicated than this, but we're just focusing on this, this aspect here. Um, so I'd already shown you that expressing ASH1 in the intestine protects the PLMs from axon breaks. So we thought, okay, is a molecule downstream of ASH1 able to do the same thing? So we expressed SPHK1 in the intestine, and indeed we observe um, a decrease in PLM axon breaks when you overexpress SPHK1. So that led us to hypothesize that potentially the active molecule um, in the neuroprotection is sphingosine 1-phosphate, because this is the only product of SPHK, SPHK1. So we did a, um, a bit of a cute experiment here um, using um, our transgenic animals and RNAi. So we took um, this line here, line two, where we're overexpressing ASH1 in, in, the, in the intestine, and it's protective. And then we knocked down S, um, SPHK1 in this same line. And you can see here that it's no longer protective. So the protective mechanism of ASH1 requires SPHK1. So that tells us that likely S1P, sphingosine 1-phosphate, is the active molecule in the neuroprotective mechanism here. 
Um, so we wanted to address that directly. Uh, luckily, you can purchase um, S1Ps, fingers M1 phosphate. So we perform very similar experiments as I showed you earlier with your solic acid. We continually supplied S1P and that was protective. And then we temporarily supplied S1P and we found that only when you provide S1P to mothers where oocytes are in the mother that you protect uh, the PLM neurons, not when you provide it late. In additionally, and this is one of the key experiments I think that, that um, enabled us to, to submit it to Nature Cell Biology is that we provided S1P to mothers for a short time period, and that provided intergenerational inheritance of the neuroprotection. This is the, one of the first times that a lipid has been shown to be providing inherited information. Um, so that was a mind blowing experiment to me, to be honest. Um, so this all together shows us that S1P protects the PLM neurons um, intergeneration. Um, so I'll take you back now to the intestine oocyte communication where there's yolk containing lipid is transferred um, through the RME2 receptor to oocytes. So we wanted to ask whether indeed S1P can be transferred to oocytes. Um, luckily, again, um, there's a fluorescent form of S1P that we could purchase. Um, so we simply fed animals this S1P fluorescein molecule and asked whether we could observe it in um, oocytes or not. So this is the intestinal lumen here, and these are oocytes. Um, and indeed, we could observe the S1P fluorescein in the intestine, but also the oocytes lighted up green too. I'm not showing you the controls here. They did not show um, any, GFP, any uh, fluorescence in the, in the oocytes. So it seems that S1P can be transferred from the um, intestine uh, two oocytes, and we also showed that that depends on the um, RME2 receptor. So um, we have this pathway here where your solic acid induces the expression of ASH1, and that leads to increased S1P um, levels. Um, but how is this regulation happening? We're providing this molecule found in plants and it's inducing um, regulation of this ASH1 gene. How is that, how is that acting? Um, so we hypothesized that it would be a transcriptional response. Um, so luckily in C. elegans, there are many um, chip sequencing data sets for multiple transcription factors um, available. So we scoured all of these um, different data sets to see if any transcription factors um, have chip peaks of the ASH1 um, locus. Um, one transcription factor really stood out to us, and this is called PQM1. You can observe a clear chip peak here in the, in the ASH1 um, um, upstream region. Why that stood out um, is that PQM1 has previously been shown to be important for lipid resourcing, stress resistance, and yolk provisioning. So it was a really clear um, potential regulator of ASH1. Um, so we wanted to investigate whether uh, PKM1 does indeed regulate ASH1. And to be honest, we don't fully understand the complexity of ASH1 regulation. Uh, it's something that we're investigating, in, investigating further now. Um, but what we did was we identified a motif um, for PKM1 in the ASH1 promoter. And we used CRISPR uh, to mutate a couple of base pairs in that motif in our animal in which we have uh, a GPH2B um, reporting the ASH1 uh, expression. And we saw a beautiful um, phenotype here where uh, in this PQM, PQM1 motif mutant, where remember there's just a couple of base pairs that have changed, we see massive induction of ASH1 in these intestinal cells. So this is a control animal here. And under the same exposure, this is our PQM1 motif mutant. So it's not expressed anywhere else. It's expressed in the same cells as in wild type, but we just have derepression. So it looks like PQM1 is a repressor um, of ASH1 expression. We are, are investigating that further um, as we speak. Um, but I thought, okay, we know that induction of ASH1 expression can 
um, reduce PLM axon breaks. That's what we have here. We have induction of ASH1 expression. So we crossed this animal um, into the MEX17 mutant uh, with the PLM uh, reporter. And I love this experiment because you've just mutated two base pairs in this promoter and you are able to rescue at least partially this neuronal phenotype just by inducing ASH1 expression in the intestine. It's one of my favorite experiments that, to be honest. Um, so yes, that was really cool. So we've, we've identified a, a receptor, sorry, a, a regulator of ASH1, and we are um, actively investigating um, how this is happening, but also why do you not have expression in the posterior? And why do you not have expression in this anterior two cells? Something that we're really interested in, in investigating at present. Um, so I've shown you today uh, that eosolic acid provided to uh, mothers uh, can protect the F1 and F2 um, PLM axons. And that is due to intestinal upregulation of ASH1, uh, which generates additional S1P, which is transferred in the yolk through the RME2 receptor to oocytes, and that enables the neuroprotection. But how is this information transferred to the F2 generation? That was a bit of a stumbling uh, block for us. Uh, we used a couple of mutants to show that it's likely not to be small RNA based. So we hypothesized that potentially the F1 animal that has increased levels of S1P um, senses that some way um, and causes upregulation of the uh, sphingolipid pathway to generate more S1P. Um, so we tested that um, here. So we used um, S1P in our ASH1 reporter. So this is the endogenous ASH1 reporter. We provided S1P just to mothers for a few hours, and we found that indeed the F1 generation has induced expression of ASH1, and that also is upregulated in the F2 generation, but not in the F3 generation. So we feel that what's happening here is the, the increased levels of S1P causes S1 causes generation of more ceramide, and that turns ASH1 on again and generates a little bit more S1P. It's sufficient to um, protect the axons of the PLM in that next generation. However, we feel that there's a, a threshold level perhaps that's um, not reached in subsequent generations, and that's why it doesn't um, continue to be protective. Okay, so reviews. Um, we were asked to do quite a lot, um, some of which I'm not gonna, gonna talk to you about. I feel that the reviews were very fair actually, um, and did strengthen the final product. Um, some of the experiments were just to confirm our RNAi experiments with mutants that we did do, and we're not gonna talk about that. Um, we were also asked how widespread the UA S1P neuroprotection was in, in, in the nervous system. So we looked at um, a few additional neurons and other um, genetic mutants that cause defects in uh, development, but also um, health of axons. And the take home from those experiments are that um, some of them were protected by S1P and UA and some were not. And that's okay, right? Um, so, but I'm not gonna, not gonna talk, about, um, talk about those today. Uh, the items in black here, I will talk about a little bit. Um, so how does the UAS1P pathway protect the neurons? Pretty important question. Um, they were worried that, you know, we only observed UAS1P protection in mutants for various, in various pathways. So they wanted us to destabilize microtubules and ask whether UA and S1P can protect against that. And I'll talk to you about that. And then also what happens when you express ASH1 in neurons? So ASH1 is predominantly expressed in the intestine, um, but single cell sequencing data has shown very, very low expression of ASH1 in some neurons, including the PLMs. So that was a, a worthwhile experiment, I think. Um, so the first thing is, you know, how does UAS1P protect um, neurons? 
Uh, so the previous work from the Hilliard lab had shown that in um, MIX-17 mutants, exons break due to poor axonal transport. And there are reporters available in which you can observe the transport of these, uh, these molecules. So we looked at a few, I'm only gonna show you one of them here. Uh, this is kinesin uh, reporter here. Um, and this is in the MEX-17 mutant. And you have accumulation of this kinesin, this posterior neurite here. Normally this is not observable in the, the kinesins more uh, in this, this region of the, of the neuron. So we provided UA or S1P to this, this model, and we see that we don't observe that accumulation in the posterior neurites any longer, suggesting that it is improving um, axon transport. Uh, so that's just one example. And that was, a, I think that was a really worthwhile uh, experiment to do. So that was very fair. Um, then they wanted us to use um, a microtubule destabilizer. So we use this molecule called uh, colchicine um, that inhibits assembly of microtubules and causes quite strong um, defects um, in uh, PLM um, axon, causes axon breaks in quite a large um, percentage of animals. Um, but even so, we could show protection. So this is the percentage of animals in wild type animals here. So around 60% of animals have a, a break. And we could reduce that um, with colchicine um, and also, sorry, with UA and also with S1P. So indeed, again, we've shown independent of any genetic mutants that um, you can suppress this, this phenotype. Um, and this is quite interesting because previous work in cell culture, at least, has shown that ceramide, not S1P, but a related molecule, uh, is responsible for anchoring microtubules to the membrane. So that was quite um, a good association. And also it's been shown that if you deplete um, ceramide, it destabilizes microtubules and you can supplement with ceramide to promote axonal growth. So these are all really nice associations with what we've what we found in our in our story. However, these are obviously in, 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 in culture models. Um, and then the final uh, experiment was to ask what happens when you express ASH1 in the nervous system and it's not good. So um, this is our control here on the left where you see the PLM axons in an L1 animal. This is a young animal here showing the development. However, if you express ASH1 in the entire nervous system, you have these axon outgrowth defects. And these are actually quite weak, these examples here. Some of these axons don't even exit the cell body in this example. However, this is with um, expression throughout the whole nervous system, but we have other promoters that we use where we express ASH1 only in the PLM axons and the same effect occurs. So it seems that the levels of ASH1 um, in, in the neurons is, is really uh, critical. Prelites. Um, this has been really fun experience, great way to, for the major findings of, of preprints to be communicated in a much more digestible format. I think it's a really um, a great initiative. And I think it facilitates some communication between the authors of the paper and, and ECRs internationally. It's really quite great to get together. I will mention that um, we initially sent this paper to um, you know, Nature Cell and uh, Science, uh, got desk rejected. Um, and when I, I was a bit disappointed about that, to be honest, but then when I contacted the Nature Cell Biology Editor, I said that our work has been pre-lighted uh, which may have helped, uh, but also I um, was a little bit more um, forthright with my arguments. And I basically said that, um, you know, if you go to PubMed and you look up sphingolipids and axons, you'll find many, 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 many papers. That's not what the story is about. So I made it very clear what the story was about and why it was novel. I think that also helped as well. So you know, cover letters and communication with editors who are extremely busy and have many, many papers flying across their desk. It's really important to communicate precisely why you think this work is important. Um, so here's the lab. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Funding, of course, um, and Wenya, who's here, done an absolutely fantastic job is continuing um, her work on this uh, as we speak.
And I think I'll finish there. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Roger, for this amazing talk. Um, it's interesting to see how it changed from a preprint idea to an actual publication. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to open the questions for the um, participants. If they want to ask a question, they can raise their hand or they can put the question in the Q&A box. Um, but at the same time, I would like to ask you some of the, the questions, especially as I work in, in overeating testes, I, I, I was really interested to see why do you have this uh, expression of this protein only in a region of the intestine cell. And I was wondering if it's actually the region where the oocytes are uptaking more yolk or if that's something to do with this proximity. Because it's been shown in Drosophila, for example, that this um, proximity or location from the intestine to the, the ovary has an effect on um, the egg. So I want to know, actually, that region you see more uptake of these. Um, yeah, it's a really, or... a really fascinating question. And um, I think... Uh, the intestine of celians was thought to be just this homogenous, you know, tissue. Uh, but some single cell sequencing data that's come out recently shows that there are signatures in different regions of the intestine. And we've been investigating that quite intensively. And there's a, a little, there's a sphingolipid um, battery of genes that are expressed in the same cells as ASH1. So we feel that there's potentially the the generation of certain sphingolipids in certain parts of the intestine that maybe need to be transferred to that oocyte. What we're doing, well, we haven't done it yet, but what we're in the middle of doing is, is um, expressing ASH1 in other regions of the intestine in the mutant to ask whether that can also rescue or not, which would answer your question. So, if, you know, if we just expressed it in, you know, a few tail um, intestinal cells, does that rescue or not, that are a little bit more distant to the oocyte. You're correct that the um, position of those intestinal cells is adjacent to oocytes. Um, maybe I'll just show it to you, it'd be easier. So, yeah, so here, for example, so there are, there are gonna be some oocytes here, right? But there are also oocytes over here in the posterior. So why would you only have expression in, for those anterior oocytes adjacent to the anterior oocytes and not the posterior ones? So it may be the case, what you're saying, but I don't know how that would make sense for the animal. Why would you just have it in that region? But maybe those finger lipids in that region of the intestine are doing other things that are really important for, I don't know what, right now. Um, so yeah, one thing that we are doing at the moment is is generating many lines in which we can um, tag just these anterior cells or just these posterior cells or just these ones in the middle to try and understand more about how um, that's regulated um, and why. So why do you have these region specific um, expression expression patterns? And we're also already identified what suppresses ASH1 expression in the posterior here. So we're really interested in understanding how, how that works and, and why, you know, um, I think people haven't really been paying attention so much to this in the past because maybe because of lack of data on region specific expression within the intestine, but yeah. So, so I think that's a really fascinating question that we're, we're focusing on quite a bit right now. So there is a question in the Q&A from Marisa Lott. It says, leading on from the previous question, could the regional expression be linked to which neurons can be protected? If you're able to express it elsewhere, maybe it could protect other neurons. Yeah, that's a great question, Marissa. So yeah, we that's something else that we are investigating um, right now. Um, yeah, um, so... We have other, we have other data where we, it suggests that um, this posterior uh, part of the intestinal expression kind of abuts where some of the neurons we're investigating stop their development. So we think that might be providing a termination cue somehow during developments. So that's a, that's separate from what we've shown here. 
So we're doing some more developmental work and we've got some really interesting phenotypes where um, that region specific expression uh, for other neurons is, is really critical. So yeah, we are um, continually to, to investigate um, what loss of ASH1 does to the rest of the nervous system as well to see if there are other other mechanisms we can we can tease out. But yeah, I'm really, you know, I, I wouldn't be working on the intestine if it wasn't for this expression pattern, but I think it's a really fascinating expression pattern there. Why do those first two intestinal cells not have expression? They probably doing something very unique in the intestine there that is not totally appreciated right now. So so Ethan, do you have your hand raised? Yes, um, I have I have questions. That was great talk. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, I, so going off from what you said earlier, I, I, I studied gut development um, during my PhD, and I actually thought about that question a lot um, when I was studying it. And one of the hypotheses that we had that I think it could be right is that during early development, they, they, they are intestinal cells that are in touch with the primordial germ cell, and not all of them are. Some of them are, uh, 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 especially the middle region when 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 the when you know during coma stage and all that. So 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 we 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 thought they might be talking to each other during development. Yeah, um, wow. There could be some yeah communication back and forth between those cells, and yeah, wow. yeah. Yeah, and also the the first two cells that you touch on, um, I like in my work, I actually could transform the first two cells into a pharyngeal light cells. So like the first two cells are important for that connection, right? Yeah. With the anchor of this tube. So wow. so they are special in that sense. I don't know how it relates or connect to what 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 did you, you said, did you look but... at anything with regard if you, if you had an animal without a germline. Without a germ line, um, not specifically. No, no, we, we haven't. No, we don't. We, like the gut is more or less normal in germline-less worms, but um, yeah, okay. in terms of actual expression pattern, expression. We, we, right, we, exactly. we didn't look. We didn't look too much. Maybe I'll maybe I'll try that out. That yeah. Be um. Yeah. That 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 could, could be cool. Um. And I have uh, I have a question actually. So um. Have you tried treating the worms with UA for more than a few hours, say, you know, maybe two a whole generation to see if it can push it more instead of intergenerational? Could you like, yeah, I think if it's like a threshold? Um, yeah, sorry. That really early on. Yeah, I think we did that for a couple of generations from memory. And it didn't affect, it didn't go any further. So it was still just the F2s mm -hmm. that were protected. So we did think about that. And we, and we did, um, we used different concentrations as well to see if that could push it any further. But unfortunately we have to use, I think we used DMSO. So then that has an effect if you go too high right. concentration of the controls, so it got a bit complicated. But so we did, um, we did try that. We, we did actually have a couple of other hits that I haven't talked about in our, in our initial screen that didn't affect um, UA. So it didn't affect the PLMs as much. And I've been toying with the idea of mixing them together to see if you can have a cocktail of <laughs> natural products that could suppress it even more. Cause maybe they're, they're acting through a different mechanism. Um, so yeah, we did try that, but cause we obviously wanted to try and get some, you know, five generations, et cetera, to, to suppress, but it wouldn't, it didn't, couldn't push it any further. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. So I also have some more questions, but if you want to um, ask your question. Me? Yeah, perfect. Uh, great talk, Roger. Uh, also, I really like that you shared the questions that were asked during review. I just wanted to sort of uh, follow up on that. I was wondering whether there were any questions that you expected to be raised during this phase, uh, let's say, that weren't, perhaps. That weren't? Yeah, so of course there were some questions raised, you, you said were fair. Uh, I just w w yeah. was wondering whether there were some maybe that you were expecting that actually weren't raised. Um, no, do you know what? I think they were really, so we had four reviewers, right? And it was great, the editor told us what their expertise were. 
Okay. So they had a sphingolipid expert, they had an axon um, health expert, they had an um, intergenerational, transgenerational expert, and they had one other, I forget what they were now. So, and they, they obtained reviewers that were really specialized in every single aspect of the, of the paper, which was amazing, really. And um, they all came back with very, very, very fair questions. There was, there was one um, question that we could not address. Uh, we had a real challenge in um, measuring S1P. The levels of S1P are so low, it's almost undetectable. And what one of the reviewers wanted us to do was to measure S1P levels at a particular time during embryonic development. Hmm. We couldn't detect S1P in like a mill of worms, let alone <laughs> a specific time during embryonic development. So we said we couldn't do that. Hmm. Just not possible. I think it's, it's fair enough. You have to, you know, um, advise the reviewers of that. It was a really interesting question, but beyond the realms of technical possibility, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that a lot of the review experiments didn't go in the paper. They were useful experiments to do, but then they answered a query that the reviewer had, and we addressed that and, and, and gave them the information. But the good thing about the publication is that the um, journal published all of the responses, right? So if you want to, you can look at what those um, questions were and then how we address them. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, responding to reviewers is an art form in itself. But you need to show that they've been heard but maybe that wasn't an appropriate question or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. So my question goes more into the downstream mechanism of S1P. Um, I know that S1P, beside being a liquid molecule, it's been shown to be a really like a messenger that could act through the receptor and trigger a lot of, lot of signaling, um, even to bind to other proteins that have an effect. So. First, do you know if the receptor of S1P is expressed either in the oocytes or in the embryos or in the neur neurons that could have uh, an effect? Yeah, so quite recently, another lab has identified what they think is an S1P receptor. So in mammals, there are very well-known receptors that don't have any orthologs in worms. Uh, but there's another molecule that's been identified more recently. The expression pattern, I really can't remember. Uh, we didn't want, didn't actually go there. <laughs> it was actually a bit of a weird timing. The receptor was kind of just identified when we were halfway through the reviews. And yeah, um, so we haven't investigated that and I don't know where it's expressed. Um, so we don't know whether it needs to act through that receptor or whether S1P somehow integrates into the membrane and affects the fluidity or um, position of proteins within the membrane to provide more structure or affects the microtubules in some way we don't really we don't really know that we were actually we were asked to um, visualize the microtubules and that's something that we it's pretty much mo it's mostly done when an axon is growing not when it's already grown so it's very difficult for us to to be able to do that and that's why we use the um, transport of protein approach rather than actually visualizing the microtubules. So the receptor question is definitely relevant, but we haven't um, investigated that. And kind of a follow-up question for that is, um, do you know if, because when I thought about the ceramides, okay, they separate into the sphingosine and the fatty acids, and my mind goes straight to the fatty acids, acetyl-CoA, histone acetylation. Um, but then you prove that actually S1P is the one having the role. So that's something that struck me. And um, do you see that S1P could also be affecting maybe the epigenetic landscape and not allowing these PQM1 protein to inhibit um, or not bind to um, the, the gene that's been shown to be uh, upregulated in the other generations? And maybe, um, I know that it's been shown that S1P can inhibit his on the upper today. So do you think it could be something related or this epigenetic inheritance could be the result yeah. of? Yeah, I totally, I totally see it. So you've done your research very well. So there are, <laughs> there's definitely some links between S1P and, and acetylation. Again, 
that is a possibility. It's not something that we uh, addressed. I think some sometimes during during a story, you got to think about where do you stop, <laughs> and we decided not to go any further with that. Um, it is something I'm definitely interested in and trying to understand how PQM1 um, is regulating ASH1. So this is a bit, there's a little bit wormy this answer, but um, it's previously been shown by the Murphy lab uh, that the uh, FOXO transcription factor DAP16 and PQM1 um, have a relationship. So when DAF16 enters the nucleus, PQM1 exits the nucleus. So the way we're thinking about this is that your solic acid acts as a minor stress and DAF16 enters nuclei when animals are stressed. So if DAF16 enters the nucleus and PQM1 exits the nucleus, then PQM1 can't repress ASH1 so much. So that's what we're, we're working on that at the moment, to try and understand that a little bit more. So we think that there's a shuttling between PKM1 and DEF16 transcription factors in and out of the nucleus, depending on the stress states of an animal or a cell. And we think that might be the um, mechanism through which ASH1 is, is regulated. But the histone deacetylase argument is definitely something that we could could look at yeah you can um so i i really love this paper well i wrote like you know i wrote a whole pre light about this is really beautiful and very you know coherent and beautiful um i was my question is is, is there a point, uh, how linear is this process for you, right? And how, how does this project that you, do you ever feel stuck with this project while, while working on it? Or um, do you try to steer it in some way so that um, to hit the, 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 the target journal that you're thinking of and, and stuff like that? Could you share with us? Yeah, it's really great. To be honest, it's one of my favorite papers as well from my whole career, to be honest. It's, it's, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so much um and i'm really proud of the um the first author so they did a, an amazing job of worked in a real good team together so i'm in the lab quite a lot so i did a lot of experiments with her as well um so um yeah as, as i mentioned i didn't want to do the rna sequencing for the longest time i thought oh, you're not going to see any changes it's not not worth it so we're kind of you know, a little bit stuck before we did that experiment. So I'm lucky I, I was convinced to do that. Um, but then you need to, you need some luck, right? I think there were 45 genes or something that were dysregulated when you provide UA, which is a real small number. And we were lucky that only one of them was a lipid related one. So we had a bit of luck there. Um, with regards to the target journal, when we had the S1P intergenerational effect, I thought, wow, that's when we need to go high because that's very, very novel. Um, so, but what I would say is that the rest of it was very linear. We said, oh, well, let's ask this question. Okay, that worked. Let's ask this question. Oh, that worked. And it all kind of like slotted into place. And that's really gives you confidence that it's real. <laughs> you know? um, but we did, we were very careful with regards to um, confirming our result, our key results in multiple different ways to really make sure, you know, um, and we didn't rush our way through this because it was, um, yeah, it was, it was really groundbreaking, I think. Um, so it was relatively linear. As soon as we got ASH1, and I learned what cer what ceramide was, <laughs> what sprinkle of it, what I thought he looked like. Then, <laughs> then it was a little bit more, um, a little bit more linear because we could think, okay, SH one has an effect, SPHK one one has an effect. Oh, there's only one molecule that SPHK one makes. Let's look at S one P, and it was all very, very lin linear from that. Um, so it was actually quite an enjoyable, enjoyable experience. <laughs> 
even the reviews, because they were, as I mentioned, they were very fair. Thank you. That's amazing. Sure. Um, just one more question from my side. I was just yeah. wondering, um, so between the preprint, which is published or posted, um, that's June or July 2022, then you have the paper being published in 2023, right, in August. Yeah. I was just wondering uh, whether there was any difference in, in reception. Like, when could you just describe what it was like when you first shared it as a preprint and then versus when you actually had it published in the in the in Nature Cell Biology? Yeah. Um... So the preprint, apart from you guys, or Ethan, you, I didn't really have that much um, response. Apart from we were invited to give a talk at the Worm Neurobiology meeting in Vienna. So that was 2022. However, when we published it, the media went absolutely crazy. So at Monash, they're really good at putting together a media release um and the day that came out and the paper came out um i i had a phone call at 5 30 in the morning from a radio station it's amazing and that whole day i had um three live tv interviews and two tv cameras came to the lab to interview me here front page of the national newspaper amazing yeah. um and it's the number one nature style biology biology paper um, for that period, was, uh, based on all those metrics. Something so you went, expected, or was it? Um, well, the media release was mostly talking about apples and pregnant women. <laughs> yeah, I see. And it wasn't talking about intergenerational inheritance of, of a lipid signal, which is what the exciting part of it is. But that's mm -hmm. very difficult for the public to understand, mm. right? But if you talk about a woman having a healthy diet, you know, mm -hmm. during pregnancy. You know, yeah. I was asked. I was asked on live TV, "Is it better for a pregnant woman to have an apple pie or a, a fresh apple?" <laughs> okay. what you know, so, so it was a little bit um, hijacked by the apple angle, uh, but that got a lot of interest. So, you know, okay. and and these these things are really important because for grant proposals, etc., you have to talk about your impact. Um, it's not just the publication. So that was very helpful. And it gets your name out a little bit more. And if that makes a difference in Australia or worldwide, then great. You know, it was an exhausting day. So you're mm. talking to the media and they ask very different questions than scientists do. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was it was a remarkable day. It was very yeah. um very impactful. So yeah. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, sure. So pull a little bit of the future outcomes of this research. Um, do you think, or are you planning to move this to a more like mammalian system to see if also can help um, regenerate the axons or be helpful for neurodegenerative diseases in, in mammalians that um, have a placenta barrier that can cross? And uh, also if it could be used maybe in the future as a treatment for this kind of um, yeah. neurodegenerative diseases. I suppose my answer would be it already is. So, you know, Spingolip is a very, this is what I said to the editor, Spingolip is a very well known to have effects on axon outgrowth and, and health, etc. cetera. Um, so all of that is of less interest to me in the story, even though it's all about <laughs> the axon health. The most interesting part for me, to be honest, is the inheritance and the expression of these sphingolipid genes in specific areas of, of an intestine. So we are, we are investigating um, more right now the developmental role of ASH1. So we've got some very interesting um, phenotypes and specific neurons where um, in an ASH1 mutant, you have uh, defective development during early larval development, but then that developmental defect is resolved over a few hours. So for some reason, lack of certain sphingolipids causes developmental defects, but there are mechanisms in place to resolve that. 
So if you think about brain development where you're extending axons, they make a mistake, it's resolved. That's happening all the time during brain development. You know? So that's really interesting, I think. So we're, we're investigating that quite extensively at the moment. We are opening it up to other neurons as well. We've, we're stepping back a little bit, to be honest, Martin. We're looking at, okay, if you don't have ASH1, what happens to various neurons during development? To get a bit more of a handle on that. And then how can you rectify that? Um, so I think the, the degeneration part of it, I'm not really going to be doing very much on. It's more about the precise regulation of these genes and how they're important for developmental mechanisms. Because I think that's less understood. Yeah. And I think for my last question, it's something that caught my eye, uh, my eye between the preprint and the actual publication is that there is a change in how it starts the introduction. So in the publication, it has like a broader um, like statement where you give more of the introduction of the problem or relevance of the research. And I was wondering if this was your idea, if it's something that the review suggested or the editorial suggested, um, or you find it really uh, important to address this um, in order to get it published um, yeah, in a factual journal. To be honest, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> But I, it may have been a feature of the journal. I think, well, I may have written it, I really can't remember, but I may have written it in a long form or a short form first. And then it, it does get modified depending on what journal you're, you're at. I don't think a reviewer asked us to modify that. It may just be a feature of, you know, you're bouncing around between journals, unfortunately, at times. And, um, Sometimes you have to extend or reduce depending on where your where your target journal is. So there was nothing requested, from what I can remember, about that. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a feature of yeah, trying to find a home. <laughs> so if no one else had any other question. I think it's great for us to close this uh, webinar. Just a reminder that on December 7th, Laura Piersuo is going to um, have another, it's our next um, webinar. It's talking about the maintenance of pluripotency-like signature in the entire ectoderm leads to neural crest stem cell potential. So if you're interested and you like these webinars, feel free to show up and listen to more talks. Right, that was really fun. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Ethan, I'll, see, I'll see you at a worm meeting, Ethan, sometime. Yes, definitely. <laughs>